You are all scientists. That's right, you heard me. Scientists, every single last one of you. The world is changing. As technologies advance and we build communities behind these technologies, entire industries are being forced to adapt. 25 years ago, if you owned a digital camera, odds are you were a photographer or a photojournalist. Today, anyone with a smartphone in their pocket, an account on Instagram or Flickr, can participate as an amateur photographer. As a result, there are over 500 million users on Instagram and 1 million photos posted every day on Flickr. Likewise, anyone with a Twitter account in the right place at the right time can participate as in real-time journalism. An earthquake takes place somewhere outside of Rome, and within minutes, there's a tweet announcing it to the world, whereas an official news announcement may come hours later. So of course, having an iPhone isn't going to make you instantly a photographer, at least not a good one. Uh, nor does having a Twitter account make you a journalist. But what it does do is it gives you the ability to participate. It gives you the means and the permission to participate in these fields, whether you have the title or not. So where will these titles shift next? Where will technologies and social platforms provide permission to participate. I believe it's in the field of science itself. In fact, we're already beginning to see it. They've even given it a name, citizen science. And there's some really great examples. SafeCast is a project that was launched and funded on Kickstarter right after the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. It provided citizen scientists with a radiation sensor that allowed them to map the radiation levels in their communities and share this data with the world on an online platform. Foldit is another really great example. Foldit is a, um, a process of discovering protein folding patterns by gamifying that process into an online puzzle video game. The game challenges players to fold proteins into complex structures, each structure given a final score. The scores are then analyzed by researchers to determine if they can be applied in the real world to fight diseases. So not only are citizen scientists collecting data, they're actually participating directly in the discovery of scientific solutions. And what's even more exciting than that is that when Folded compares the scores of those participants, citizen scientists, with no previous expertise in these fields, to those of scientific experts, it was the citizen scientists that greatly outperformed the experts. So these examples, and there are many others, are already beginning to demonstrate the value and the power of citizen science. Yet somehow, these projects are still limited to small groups of enthusiasts. Citizen science has yet to become mainstream. But I believe it will. I believe citizen science will become mainstream. In fact, I believe it must become mainstream in order to help solve some of the grand challenges the world is facing today. Now, the challenge that's closest to my heart is the challenge of understanding and protecting our oceans. So this may explain the reason why I'm wearing a red beanie when it's like 30 degrees outside, right? It's not just because I'm a total Jacques Cousteau fan, which I am. Jacques Cousteau invented the aqua lung. This is the technology that led to the scuba diving breathing equipment that every diver uses today. So he not only inspires me as an inventor, he inspires me as a photographer, an explorer, and perhaps one of the greatest ocean activists the world has seen. Still, I, I know it's kind of weird, the beanie, um, but it, it serves as a constant reminder to myself of the men and women like Cousteau, like Sylvia Earle, who have dedicated their lives to protecting our ocean. Now this is an ocean that sometimes seems so vast and limitless, it's too big to fail. But we know that this is wrong. We know that the ocean is failing. We know that temperatures are rising. We know that the overfishing and trawling of our ocean has put its ecosystems into imbalance. We know that the dumping of man-made chemicals and industrial runoff has led to over 150 hypoxic dead zones, maybe even 400 to 1,000, 
of zones where nothing can live, nothing can survive due to a lack of oxygen. We know that the ocean is failing. And if it fails, we fail. If it fails, we fail. The ocean absorbs more than 50% of the man-made carbon dioxide that we emit, while at the same time producing more than 70% of the oxygen we breathe. The ocean provides nutritional and economic wealth to billions of people on this planet, especially some of the world's poorest. And as it turns out, our coastal areas, those areas that are within the 100 kilometers from our coastlines, are some of the most important, producing more than 60% of the global gross national product. And yet, these are some of the ecosystems that are most endangered. Coincidentally, this is where we, as individuals, are most active. This is where coastal communities fish. This is where we go on vacation with our loved ones. This is where we go scuba diving and where we snorkel. So thinking about these things has completely changed the way that I approach my work and especially the way that I'm developing one of our technologies, OctoTalk. OctoTalk is a citizen science technology platform that essentially crowdsources the environmental monitoring of the ocean to the millions of scuba divers and snorkelers that are in the ocean every day. Originally, uh, the idea behind OctoTalk was essentially to reinvent the scuba diving mass to allow them to talk underwater and share their experiences in real time. And then we realized that such a consumer product, if executed on a large enough scale, would provide the perfect opportunity to collect an enormous amount of data on the health of our oceans. So that's exactly what we decided to do. We've equipped OctoTalk with a suite of sensors that allow us to monitor things like temperature, uh, pH, which tells us about the acidity and oxygen in the water, the depth, even the amount of light that's in the water. We're also making it compatible with other devices like GoPros for video and image capture, and dive computers, essentially turning every scuba diver and snorkeler into a distributed monitoring network while they're in the water, all connected to a centralized data and intelligence platform when they come out of the water. So currently we're testing and piloting the prototypes and a beta version of the data platform in different spots around the world. And I was in Monterey Bay, California testing the prototypes recently and one evening after the test, I was hanging out in a small park right next to the ocean. And a family came through the park. Mom, dad, a few teens, even a small child in a stroller. And it was nighttime, but all of their faces were illuminated by the glow of either a smartphone or a tablet. Even the baby in a stroller. And then they all stopped at the same time and just started doing this. <laughs> Flicking these imaginary balls at poor, defenseless, imaginary animals. <laughs> now, you've probably seen this, the Pokemon Go effect. And if you haven't seen it, and you're not, or, or you're not playing the game yourself, you've at least heard of it. It is a mainstream topic. And this is exactly how mainstream scientific discovery needs to become. So I'd like to share a few elements and a few things that we've learned from OctoTalk that I think are necessary for this to happen, for scientific discovery to become mainstream. First, the scientific problem has to be big, huge even, so huge that it almost seems impossible, almost impossible, unless we all get involved. So in our case, it's, it's pretty simple. The challenge of understanding our ocean and the link that has to climate change is a global issue that affects us all. Second, the barrier to entry has to be low enough that anyone feels they have the ability to participate. In fact, the ideal is if it's integrated directly into an activity that people are already engaged in. So the promise of promising someone who's snorkeling the magical ability to talk underwater basically becomes an easy way for us to opt in individuals whether they self-identify as a citizen scientist or not. Third, once in, the participants need to be appropriately incentivized to continue to participate. 
So of course we're looking at gamification and things like machine learning, not only to engage the participants in a fun way, but to also engage them directly so that they can participate directly in the, in the discovery of scientific solutions. For example, identifying specific, specific fish or coral species. And finally, the data that we collect, the scientific data that we collect, must be constantly calibrated and validated. So we have the continuous challenge of calibrating our data with those external sources that are already trusted by the scientific community and also engaging that scientific community to participate directly in our platform side by side with the citizen scientists. So I think these are a few of the elements that are necessary to make scientific discovery mainstream. And this is critical if citizen science is going to become, is going to live up to its full potential in helping us solve some of the grand challenges that we're facing today. Now again, my challenge happens to be ocean conservation. But maybe your challenge is different. Maybe your challenge is climate change, sustainable food production. Maybe your challenge is trying to figure out how to solve issues with air quality. Whatever it is you're passionate about, whatever challenge you think is most important, somewhere in there, there's science to be done. Now, do you need to be a scientist, like I said in the beginning of the talk, to do that science? I don't believe you do. I believe all you have to do is be you. Grab a snorkel and jump in the water with me. Follow your passion, look online, and choose one of the many citizen science projects that already exist. And if you don't find one that fits you, build one yourself. Be you. And realize you have the ability to participate. In fact, I would say, Given the challenges that we're facing, you, we, not only have the ability, but we have the responsibility to participate in the scientific discovery that's happening all around us every day. Thank you. <laughs>